record on this computer. And then we will share screen. Go to the info. There we go. All right. So once again, we'll uh, be looking at the uh, Gospel of John and we'll um, just walk through. As always, if there is some question you have or want, want me to slow down or pause on anything, just uh, feel free to, to ask. I mean, there's four of us today, so we should be fine to take as much time or uh, as we'd like. We can be leisurely about it for sure. All right, so uh, last week we looked at the baptism slash the non-baptism of Jesus. Um, if you don't know, in the in that first chapter, the gospel in the Gospel of John, John the Baptist talks about um, a moment that sure sounds like the baptism of Jesus, but you never actually see Jesus enter the water or John baptizing him. It's just John has a vision of Jesus being the Messiah, but there's no baptism. But it's one that if you aren't, if you just sort of blend it or aren't, aren't really listening, paying attention to the details, you might think that it is um, that baptismal moment. We also look, there are three call narratives. There are three different parts there where um, Jesus begins to call disciples. One, there's the first one is just two disciples that sort of show up and uh, follow Jesus because John says you should follow him. He's the Lamb of God. And uh, then the second one is Andrew finds his brother, Simon Peter, and they both follow Jesus. And then finally, the last one is about uh, the calling of Nathaniel. But in each case, it is, they are call narratives, but they're very different from the, the uh, synoptic gospels, the Matthew, Mark, and Luke gospels. The fundamental question is, who is this Jesus? Not just in that first chapter, but throughout the text, right? There's this question of, who is Jesus and who is this person that's walking among us? The text is clear that it's God, but we have to work our way through. Who <laughs> and those call narratives, um, it's really, there are two names that happen in the first chapter. And one is, he's called the Lamb of God, according to the John the Baptist. And the other is the disciples basically just, they don't really make a proclamation as much as they just say, well, we'll stay with you. We'll remain with you. We'll dwell with you, Lord. We'll follow you. Um, and that seems to actually be the real action that uh, of discipleship, Gospel of John. It's not about seeing a particular title or name as much as it is just the main, our main goal as Christians is to perhaps remain with Jesus, abide with him, if you use the old King James language, right? Abide with me, stay with me, remain with me, be with Jesus. So that's the quick overview of last week. Today, we'll jump right in. Um, this is the third chapter, starting with the first verse. Um, Episcopalian's favorite, uh, most Episcopalian's favorite part of the Bible, changing water into wine. Um, on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. All right, so we'll pause there for just a second. Um, the time, all time in the Gospel of John is, it's seldom about time. Um, it's usually much more metaphorical. Um, that is, if it's night, it's all about darkness or being in the dark. Um, we'll see that in the next chapter, in chapter 3, when Nicodemus shows up, um, then it's in the dark. He shows up to talk to Jesus, but literally Nicodemus is in the dark about who Jesus is. And so it's, it happens at night, right? It can be literal. Time could be literal, but it's usually meant metaphorically, I think. And especially in this case, uh, we talk about how it's three days later. Um, or it's actually on the third day. It's not even three days later. On the third day. We're not even sure what third day from what. Most likely meant metaphorically, and most likely the third day is a reference to the resurrection. Um, that's what we all know it to be, right? On the third day, he rose again from the dead. That's very much the case here. So we should understand that um, this passage on the third chapter uh, is, I mean, the second chapter, rather, 
is absolutely, as we start, we should understand that we're talking about the resurrection. We're talking about the end of the story, even though it's the very beginning of the story. Um, and uh, one of those great themes that is in scripture is this messianic banquet, as it's called. Uh, if you don't remember, it comes in Isaiah, and actually we read it at a lot of funerals, where um, they say, in the great day to come, the Messiah will come, and there will be a great feast on the mountain, on Mount Zion, and we will all have great food and great wine, um, wines uh, strained clear, as this passage says. Um, and so there's this idea that the Messianic banquet will be a great feast. And then even with the Synoptic Gospels, they have this idea, Jesus talks a good deal about that feast being like a wedding banquet. So we don't actually have, as I said at the beginning, the Gospel of John does not have any parables. Instead, what we have are these almost enacted parables, where you, if you've read the other Gospels, you should probably be thinking here, oh, well, this is maybe Messianic. And it, perhaps even it's like when Jesus talks about the wedding banquets in those Gospels. They, we don't have a figurative wedding banquet. We have a literal wedding banquet. Um, and so uh, John is sort of enacting a parable, enacting those stories that Jesus shares in other places, right? Um, good to see you, Harry, Margaret. Glad you're here. Um, so we're looking at that first uh, passage, uh, or as I like to say, the Episcopalian's favorite passage, uh, water to wine, um, is, and we're looking just at that first part. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and literally all we've gotten is the first dependent clause there, uh, the, the third day being most likely the day of the resurrection, um, or at least hinting at that idea. And then wedding in Cana of Galilee, um, again, there's this idea that there's feasting and there is a, it is a glorious day, right? Um, a good day to celebrate. We then notice, of course, Jesus and his disciples are, are there, his mom's there, and then the wine gives out. Um, so a couple of additional items that we'll talk about real quick with that. Jesus is not being insulting when he says, woman, what is that to you and to me? This is one of those, um, a lot of women get very worried that Jesus is being disrespectful to his mom. Most likely not the case. It's far more akin to just saying something like, hey man, what's happening, right? Sort of a colloquialism of just referring to someone like, hey dude, what's up? Hey, buddy, what, what, what is that to you and me? Almost. It might be a little casual, but it's not an insulting or demeaning um, way of re replying, right? What I do love about this passage is that Mary clearly believes and understands that Jesus can do what is needed to help. Um, and he, she hasn't taken no for an answer, right? And it makes me really more, what this passage makes me wonder about almost as much as anything is what Jesus's childhood was like, right? I mean, was he changing water to wine before this so that Mary has such confidence that he can do these things you would have to wonder what maybe she has seen him do before. We don't, the stories we don't hear about, but she had witnessed in some other ways. Um, so what else do we see in that at least opening part? We'll go into the second part, the actual changing water into wine, but is there anything else? And I'll go back to it real quick. Anything else we see in that passage? Fear or question? Well, one thing uh, in the Gospel of John is that the Gospel writer never gives the name of the mother of Jesus. Mm, right. Yeah, it's just the mother, never Mary, per se. So I think, I, I think one is called to wonder what, what the Gospel writer, what's the, what the, what's the purpose of that approach? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Anything else that uh, interests y'all in this, the first five verses here? Okay. Well, I, th I think we're, we're called to wonder what's the metaphor that we're, it's being called into question by saying the wine gave out. I mean, it's the gospel writer has in mind, I think, a, a circumstance. Right, and certainly some people have posited a whole idea that uh, the wine gave out, and this is a, a crisis of hospitality, right? Like there is an issue 
the same way it would be embarrassing for any of us if we had a big party and everybody came over and they drank us out of all of our wine, um, that there's an expectation that you would have enough for people to have a drink or two and enjoy themselves. It's a little bit embarrassing if you can't feed people enough or have enough wine uh, that it could be perceived as um, a commentary on the person who's hosting, right? On that, um, the family who is throwing the celebration. Um, so there's a, yeah, there is a little bit of that connotation um, that this is an emergency um, one way or another. Sort of the life is going out of the party. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the life has gone out of the party indeed. Okay, well, we'll look ahead here to the next. So the next part is the actual sort of miracle side of it. Sitting there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up with the brim. And he said to, to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. And when the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, Though the servants who had drawn the water knew, who had called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk, but you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. As he went down to Capernaum with his brother, his brothers, and his disciples, and they remained there for a few days. That's the, the miracle side of it. I want to take a quick look at a couple of things. One, there are six water jars for purification. This takes a little bit of clarity uh, because there's been a lot of bad preaching and then even anti-Semitic preaching and teaching around purification. That is, a lot of times you'll hear preachers talk about how someone was unclean or Jesus risked being unclean, um, all these kinds of ideas. So let's take a moment just to talk about what it, what the purification was in Judaism and still is in Judaism. It's really not hard. Um, that is to keep kosher is to work with things and keep things that are clean. So if something comes in contact uh, with pig, then it's unclean. It doesn't mean someone's going to hell. Usually what it means is you have to wash your hands. It's just that simple. There is not a complex ritual needed if you touch a pig um, and you're trying to keep kosher. You're just trying not to do it. Um, so it's really simple. If someone is unclean, um, ritually unclean, then they either take a ritual bath, which is, well, and it's really nothing more than here's some clean water, immerse yourself, say a prayer, and you're clean, right? Wash the dishes if there's pork that touches your plate or there's something that's not supposed to be on your plate or then you wash the dishes or you wash your hands. So um, when we get into a lot of that, and you'll notice that if you now, if you have that in your mind, it's really that easy for purification, then when you hear someone talk about how um, Jesus comes to cleanse us or Jesus is uh, breaking all the purity laws to show that they're not worthwhile and all that stuff, then you can also look at it and say, we're not, it's literally like you have to, you need to wash your hands before you go out, right? I mean, it's not really, it, there's nothing that Jesus talks about that's really a rejection of the purity laws or codes. This is something that Christians have laid on top of it that is not necessarily there. This is actually a perfect example. At no point does Jesus say that the purification jars are terrible or awful. They're just there. What it's really about is, um, yeah, so I like to be as unclean as accurate, but the solution is simple to wash or take a bath. So, these water jars are to just really there. And the main reason we were told that they're jars for purification, it means that you needed clean water in the jar, right? Um, if you've ever worked uh, at, in a farm or around any of the sort of outdoor stuff, uh, you know that there's clean water that you try to keep that's water for drinking or cleaning things. And then sometimes you have non-potable water that you just need to rinse off the mud on your boots, right? That you don't care that it's as clean. So the only real thing about those water for, jars for purification on one level is to say, eh, there's, these are jars for, that kept clean water, right? Um, but it, then we have to flip the switch a little bit and say, this is the gospel of John. 
So um, there's always metaphor within it. And the real question is, where is the seventh jar? That is, six is always an incomplete number. You don't, you very rarely see the number six in, uh, in Judaism or Christianity for that matter, because it's usually we're talking about seven or 12, like the 12 tribes of Israel or the seven days of creation. You don't talk about six. Things are incomplete if they're six. Um, and typically, most likely, people would also sort of almost like good luck, right? It's lucky to have seven of this or seven of that. Um, in the same way, there that there would be this fundamental question if you were a first century listener, well, where's the seventh jar? Why do they only have six jars and not seven jars? Um, and I'm going to follow that through real quick. Some scholars and theologians will point to Jesus as the seventh jar, that seventh um, jar of purification. Um, Maybe that's it. Others will just say we're waiting for the seventh, like we're waiting for the seventh day. Hard to say. It's just a question. These are those questions, and this is what the Gospel of John does a lot. It presents you with things and sort of, there. it's not afraid of ambiguity in the Gospel of John. John is very adept at putting stuff in front of us and asking the question, and then we have to wrestle with it, and 2,000 years later, people are still wrestling with, it could mean this, or it could mean that, or it could mean something else, or it could be a code that we don't know, we no longer know. There's all that that gets wrapped up in the Gospel of John, right? Okay. The other part, uh, the focus really that we need to name for this miracle, it's the mother of Jesus is now completely off stage. She has done her part. She basically told Jesus to help the party. Jesus is even off stage. He's not even present for the actual miracle. The focus is completely on the servants. It's 100% about the servants. You have to go load up the jars of water. And keep in mind, they're usually, they're using buckets. They're drawing from a well, right? So they have to fill six 30-gallon jugs, 180, they have to find 180 gallons of water to fill these jars with. So there's a whole lot of work involved. And even then, what they have to then do is take a cup of water to the wine steward, right? So they fill it all up, and then Jesus goes, oh, take a cup over there to the, uh, to the wine steward and thinks what he, see what he thinks about your cup of water. Um, and that's a pretty extraordinary moment if you take a minute to think about it, because I'm sure the wine steward, these servants are like, why would I take water to the wine steward? He doesn't want water. He wants more wine. Um, and there's something obviously that happens miraculously between taking that cup of water out of the water jars and to the wine steward, but we're not privy to exactly what moment the miracle happens, just that it does happen in that moment. Um, so those are the initial things. Let me go back to the uh, verses themselves. Do we want to look, uh, what else stands out in these passages that y'all see or hear? <clears throat> The other fundamental thing we can say is, I don't know what party you go to, but if I've got 180 gallons of wine, that's a whole abundant <laughs> party right there too, right? After this miracle happens, they are gonna, the party is going on for quite a while. Well, I think there's a comparison of, um, Sort of, um, sort of a qualitative comparison mm -hmm. that um, on the one hand, pre-Jesus, you've got this huge volume and it's just water. And um, when you inject Jesus into the mix, it becomes fine wine. And I, you know, I, so I, I think part of it is, you know, it, it, you know, is from the perspective of the, the gospel writer who's been excluded from the synagogue. Absolutely, yeah. We have the better wine. Could certainly be that side. 
I think we certainly have, again, if, if we understand, go, we go back to this as the third day, this is a day of perhaps the Messianic banquet or what the what it will be like to be in heaven is the easier way to say that than the Messianic banquet. Not everybody says Messianic banquet. Um, but if this is what it's like to be heaven, then, then the wine's going to be plentiful and really, really good, right? It's not simple. The wine we're used to, but it's going to be something exceptional <clears throat> at the end when we get to that end. Um, that, that we uh, tend to think it's going to be one thing, but it will not just plateau, but get better and better. You know, I think about the word glory, sort of how that's used. I mean, as I, as I understand that, it, it's sort of, um, you know, looking at these concepts of transcendence and eminence, that the, the glory has to do with the eminence of God. So, so the revelation of the glory, I mean, this is how the nature of Jesus became, as God became present to those he encountered. Absolutely. And revealed his glory seems to have that sort of connotation that he is more than you think, right? There's that glory. Um, in Greek, it is doxa, um, which is where doxology comes from. Uh, those are words about God's glory. Our doxology is words about God's glory, his doxa. Um, in Hebrew, it is uh, kavod. Um, and when I did the pulpit swap um, Friday and Sunday with, uh, with our Jewish neighbors, and they were talking about the kavod of God. Um, that, and that idea that glory is certainly, um, and not just glory, it's presence, it's a uh, a little bit of everything, but it's that again that it's that transcendence of God, but drawn near. So it's the eminence of God. Mm -hmm. Said, Lynn, it's that idea that uh, even though we're in their case, they were talking about how even though we're separated and sitting in our own homes, that uh, we can still feel God's glory, His kavod, His presence with us. His um, uh, that imminent God is nearby, um, which I found fascinating, just from from the current you know conversation, Jewish perspective. So. Um, that's good. Bill, didn't you say that up to this point, his disciples really weren't quite sure who he was? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, they. they and I'm wondering if interested enough to follow, but they're not sure what's going on. Right, and I'm I'm wondering whether or not Jesus might have thought, "Hmm, I need to do something dramatic here." <laughs> <laughs> he did it, and his <laughs> disciples said, and his disciples believed in him. You know, they couldn't, couldn't deny him at that point. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I, you know, I, I, when I look at that too, I think about the word believed and, um, you know, it makes me recall, um, um, a path, you know, a, an excerpt from a book by Diana Butler Bass. We read an EFM, EFM a couple of years ago about the, what the word believe means to us today and what it would have meant at the time of, for example, um, the, when the creeds were written and that the word believe is really related, you know, in old English is related to the word beloved. And so this is really not intellectual belief, but it's really, you know, who I give my heart to. I think that's, certainly, yeah. Yeah, that's very accurate for how the Gospel of John handles the term believe. Um, it, you, at the very end, when uh, Peter and the beloved disciple hear from Mary Magdalene that Jesus is not in the tomb, and they run, they race to the tomb, they look around, they sort of um, poke around and try and figure out what's going on, um, and it says they believed but then literally they also say, but they were unsure what had happened, right? They, it's the sort of, they love this idea that something had happened, that Jesus perhaps was risen, risen, but they weren't even, they didn't know. They couldn't, their brain couldn't comprehend it. So there was almost an oppositional idea there at the end between to believe in someone, to love them and to care, but not always to understand, comprehend, or that sort of, again, like we use it in the 21st century, it's sort of intellectual agreement with something right i believe you i believe in something is to intellectually agree and it's 
much more about the heart and about faith even before it's understanding. Hmm. <clears throat> all right, well, we will um, look at the second half of the chapter, which is always a fun one. So we are, again, we're in the first, the second chapter of John. This is really the beginning Jesus didn't want to start with the uh, turning water into wine, but his mother convinced him to do it. The next part is really what um, most scholars would say is the beginning of his public ministry. This is where Jesus starts his ministry in the Gospel of John, where he chooses to begin. So we'll look at that. Um, the Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. He found the people selling cattle, sheep, and doves and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, these, take these things out of here, stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? He was speaking at the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. All right, so... Quick uh, asterisk for this, like always, the Jews likely refer to the temple authorities in this passage. Um, apart from, of course, at the beginning, it says the Passover of the Jews. That would refer to all of them. Um, but in this case, certainly the people who are asking Jesus questions, like the Jews who say, who gave you the authority to do this, are most likely the temple authorities, not necessarily just your average Jew, because Jesus was a Jew. All of his followers are Jews. So they're, uh, that is a, uh, again, a sort of a little bit confusing terminology. The other thing that we need to name real quick is the idea that Jesus had three-year ministry, which we you hear constantly people refer to. It comes from John. Jesus shows up to all the religious festivals of the temple. While they will talk constantly in the Gospel of John's about the Jews say this and the Jews do that, and there's a very sort of negative connotation to being Jewish, the time we see Jesus as the most Jewish is in the Gospel of John. He shows up to three different Passovers. He shows up to a Sukkot and, and to a Hanukkah, along many other celebrations. He is constantly in the te temple teaching and preaching and doing work and ministry. Um, he is a faithful and devout Jew in the Gospel of John. Um, even while we hear this sort of terminology about the Jews said this and the Jews do that, um, and even their fear of the Jews and those kinds of terms, most of it is coming from John, who at the same time has Jesus is very, very Jewish. Um, the other, uh, the cleansing of the temple, we just need to name. I'm sure you noticed it. It's a story that's in all four Gospels, but uh, it's obviously in a very different place. The beginning of Jesus' ministry, not Holy Week, not the last of his ministry. Um, what else do you all hear in, in uh, John's telling? And I'll go back and pull up the passage just to see um, which I might want to talk about in that but what speaks to you about this thing? And actually, I'll, I'll name one real quick. I, um, one of the most telling is the line, he made a whip of cords and drove them all out of the temple. But he makes it very clear who he drove out. It was not the money changers he drove out. It's the people. It's the sheep and the cattle that he drives out, right? Um, he's driving out the, the, uh, the animals, not the folks. Um, which is different than in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's much more he's driving out the money changers and declaring that they're making it a den of thieves, right? There's a question about is the uh, practice honest or trustworthy to a certain degree? In the same, in a different way, this is not the uh, declaration here. Instead, what we have is it's stop making my house, my father's house, a marketplace. You're all, it's not, he's not saying anyone's dishonest. He's just saying you, we should be praying here, right? Or we should be doing something other than selling, buying and selling animals.
what else do we see in either part of this passage? <laughs> Muted himself. We, we, we see, um, I mean, to, to an extent, the whole gospel is written with this tongue in cheek of, you know, we know what's, we know the end of the story and Jesus says things that the reader can understand and we are to sort of marvel and somewhat humor about how these other people just don't get it. And um, so, yeah, you know, it seems as if a big theme is the people who are so caught up in their rules bound approach to faith. You know, it's like they can't see the forest for the trees. Mm -hmm. And so they're, you know, I, I mean, I, to me, that's sort of, he's hints at that when he says, well, you know, we've got these 180 gallons of water, but look what Jesus does. You know, Jesus, you know, leaves them in the dust with his fine wine. And now we've got people, well, so that they could, you know, I guess you went to the temple and you would buy the animals for a sacrifice or whatever. And so that's, mm -hmm. and so there's this elaborate structure of, of commerce that's around the sacrifice and you know essentially jesus is saying yeah you, you know the ministry is that you're missing the point and um and just and they, they go on to miss the point when jesus so jesus again tongue in cheek knowing they won't get him talks about destroy this temple in three days i will raise it up and 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 indeed they don't get what he means how should they based on what he said but um it, so it's just this this whole message of jesus is doing a new thing he's bringing a totally new way of looking at things and the the people that that need to hear it and take it in and perceive it are not receptive right right I think, um, yeah, I think that's certainly all part of it. Bill, where was it written, uh, zeal for your house will consume me? Oh, I'd have to look it up, but I believe it's, uh, I mean, it's one of the old, it's one of the prophets, but I, I would have, I mean, I don't have a, a reference in front of me right now. That's okay. I'm just curious. Yeah. Um, the other, uh, the other thing that we can name that this would be something that um, uh, Brody and, and some other theologians will point out is Jesus is because it's the Passover and and there during Passover you need a lamb right you need a lamb to be part of the Passover sacrifice and the Passover offering so we've just heard jesus described as the lamb of god he drives out all of these sheep and cattle so the only person left is the lamb of god at the passover too right and so there's this sort of question as well a deeper question of is jesus making a almost um enacted parable here of he drives out all the other animals and says you don't need them you only need me at this point um it's an interesting interpretation uh I, I like it, but it, it, you know, I don't know if it does it as explicitly. It's a little more implied. The other thing to name real quick, as um, as Lynn was talking about, um, location matters or the story matters. So Jesus only shows up for one Passover in the Synoptics and cleanses the temple at the end of his ministry. But this is the first public action of John, and it's the setting the tone, right? I mean, it, it's that kind of thing. What's the inaugural address of each president, right? What are they trying to claim as the things they're going to do? It's very much the same here. So if uh, this is that setting that tone, then uh, 
what is he setting as his ministry in this gospel? What is Jesus's ministry going to be about? Uh, becomes a fundamental question. Anybody have any ideas? You want to take a risk on this one? We don't have to go super deep. It's pretty clear, I think. I'm going to speak, and I, I shouldn't come warn me before this started. But I, I, when I look at the Bible, I, I'm much more simple and I, and not very scholarly. But to me, the story is always sort of been a guide to like church is holy and it's for us to worship and not commercialize and a place to be safe. And obviously I need to get back in there because it makes me emotional to talk about it. But um, this, didn't say, and don't hurt his father's house. Well, I really do need to get back to church for a long time. You know, so it's always been comforting to me. And also, as a child, surprised me because we were taught that, you know, about his perfection and his lack of sin. And I remember struggling with the fact that he was angry, you know, that surprised me. And it, that Jesus could be angry and, you know, tell people to get it or tell, I mean, you say he got the animals out, but I was always surprised at his anger too. And that was mm -hmm. you know, something that I feel like I had to, I guess, learn about. Yeah. I think you're spot on, Donna. I mean, I really think what is, what is the setting? What is, what is Jesus's ministry going to be about? It's going to be focusing on God. It's going to be focusing on that, connection with the divine over money over um commerce over um the structures that uh, people thought they understood and knew and maybe could even control god like if i give you two turtle doves then i get this kind of thing like transaction relationship um i think all of that is part of what jesus's ministry he's is declaring his ministry is going to be about um and it's also going to be one that uh, to, to, to really say it in a way that you just said it, it's going to be upsetting, right? It's going to be a ministry that's to a certain degree upsetting to people. We want it to be um, easy and straightforward, but he's going to get angry and he's going to get frustrated and he's going to have some of those human emotions that don't make him less perfect as a being um, at all, uh, but definitely make us wonder what part of faith is that righteous indignation? What part of our faith is that um, being upset for the right reasons, right? I mean, being not just being upset because someone, I don't know, took your crayons, <laughs> but much more, what are these deeper and more important things that we should be paying attention to and be upset about, about ways that religion's been misused or ways that we um, find that we aren't in right relationship with God? Um, and, and so there is, I think, an aspect of this, too, that's saying, Jesus is saying, this is going to be upsetting to people. My ministry is not going to be one that is just easily accepted and everyone says this is great. It's going to be one that's literally turning over tables, right? Good, good stuff. Um, the other thing, and then this is what uh, Lynn was saying. Um, I just talked about that. Um, the one that, um, this is the thematic point that, that Lynn was making on the Gospel of John. It's tongue-in-cheek, it's snarky, but Jesus always, throughout the Gospel, um, because we know the end of the story, we know he's almost talking to us. We know how the story ends, and so there are these moments where Jesus speaks literally on one level, on one higher level. And then the people listening hear it on a different level, right? Um, and, and like in this case, he says on the third day, or I will or we restore this temple in three days. And he's talking about his body, but they're all literally wondering about the temple behind them that took 46 plus years to build. Um, and there's just this constant process where Jesus is speaking on a different level, but the real invitation I think there, I mean, a little bit of is a winking nod to the fact that we know more of what's going on. But it's also this invitation for us to go deeper that Jesus has so much more to say than just one simple thing, right? And we'll see that next week when we talk about um, Nicodemus, uh, the third chapter of the Gospel of John, where he'll say, I, 
you have to be born again to be in the kingdom of heaven. Um, and Nicodemus starts asking these ridiculous questions like, well, how can I crawl in my mother's womb a second time? And Jesus sort of just laughs at him and goes, no, 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 no. You can't do that. We're talking about being born again, being born from above, being born of God, right? Um, and it's this challenge for us to go deeper, not to just expect that religion or faith is going to have a simple, completely straightforward, and always even completely understandable answer, that much more it's this challenge for us to explore God's Word, to go a little bit deeper, um, right? That's, that's part of it. That final passage, just to close up the uh, chapter, then is sort of a coda on this. But when he was in Jerusalem during the Passover festival, many believed in his name because they saw the signs that he was doing. Jesus, on his part, would not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to testify anyone, for he himself knew what was in everyone. This is at one of those classic Johannine um, commentary parts that, uh, quite frankly, is more than a little confusing. If you just sort of sit there and read it, you could sit with this passage for a very, very long time. The story of the turning over the tables in the temple is pretty, yeah, okay, you turn the tables over, this is what happened, and there's a little bit more going on. But at the same time, it doesn't take that super level interpretation. This, on the other hand, with this sort of idea that Jesus knows everyone and didn't need anyone to tell anybody about anyone, and he didn't trust himself to them. All of this sort of is this very mystic view of Jesus, right? That he is certainly God and in power, and that he doesn't necessarily need our help. We need him, but he does not necessarily always need. Um, before I go on, what what else in this passage might might speak to you? This sort of concluding coda of chapter two. Well, I, I like your I'm, I'm, uh, your, your your mention of the word uh, mystic. Um, you know, I mentioned Bishop Spong's book, and he believes that, the, that essentially the fourth gospel writer was a mystic, and that he's really writing about how one you know it's it's about being in relationship with God, mm -hmm. and um, and in fact. You know, you can look at, at the, the prologue, and then you can look at, I guess it's uh, chapter 20, which is sort of like, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you. And at the end, he says, now I'm going to tell you what I told you. And he says, I've told you these things so that you can have real and abundant life. Or th that's probably, those are probably the Eugene Peterson words, but have life and have it abundantly. And it's, right. it's, it's, so he, he's here, which again is sort of this notion of the, the, the fine wine. But um, so he, he's speaking to people about how to have real and eternal life with God. And they want to be looking at what the price of a, an animal is for sacrifice. I mean, it's just like, right. so, um, and, and yet, he, you know, surely here he's saying, if he can look into people's hearts and know what they're about, then, you know, again, he's, he's sort of telling us this is who Jesus really is. Yeah, I think so. Um, let's see. What, so again, it, it's, um, that final passion shows us that folks are trying to figure out who Jesus is. They're, they believe in him. Maybe not fully have an intellectual knowledge of who he is, but they're starting to believe because they've seen sort of the miracles and heard some of the stories about him. But he doesn't need help figuring us out, right? He has a pretty good idea who we are, mm -hmm. um, part of that. And it, and it almost seems like a throwaway line or two. It's easy to sort of dismiss those last two lines, but that is that really deep mystical side of John that, it's so much more about Jesus really knows us so much more and still cares. Um, I mean, you can look at it as that sometimes, and people will sometimes portray Jesus in the gospel of John that way. Like he is this almost otherworldly figure and he just sort of floats along and goes, I don't need to know you. I already know you. But there's a much deeper, I think it's a deeper meaning is 
that Jesus knows us and is still going to have the conversation anyway, <laughs> knows that we can't figure out what the heck's going on, but we'll still say, you've got to quit making this a marketplace, right? Still risk relationship, um, even if it seems like he's angry and frustrated, which I think he is angry and frustrated um, as he turns over those tables. But it's to risk that anger knowing that we need to hear it, that we need to see that anger is okay. It's part of the human experience. And that uh, sometimes that's the best way to respond to people that are unjust or the focus is in the wrong place. Sometimes you have to make a little bit more noise. If, if the last month of our existence has been anything it has been sharing that as we watch the marches and the protests that when things really aren't fair and things really aren't working then there's a place for protest and anger and righteous indignation because things are not going the way they're supposed to go um it's not always just the beatific stand back and i know who you are it's the i'm going to risk going deeper and make things better because I do know you and I do actually care enough to be in relationship with you. Um, that, that becomes part of the story for sure. All right, we're getting close to time here. So um, any, anything else we wanna talk about? Next week we'll look at chapter three, which again is that story of Nicodemus, uh, who is on the, um, he's one of the Pharisees, likely on the Sanhedrin, we get that um, part of his story later, but we, we certainly learned that he is one of those folks who, again, is a Jew and is someone trying to understand who Jesus is the way we all are, um, but doesn't always fare well. He does his best, but uh, like all of us, there's times we get an idea of what's happening and times we get... So feel free to look at that third chapter. You'll, you'll recognize that if you were born and raised in the South, you have heard chapter three, if nothing else um because it's all about being born again we know that one. it's not if no other part of the gospel of john we know that one um but look forward to our time together next week my friends um is there anything else um we want to engage or talk about oh um margaret called me just uh as we were starting because she was like i did last week was having a hard time getting in so my request would be if, if you could get the media folks when they send out the weekly email that has links to the Christian formation on Sunday and all of that to include, you know, this, this session, you know, in it, that'd be great. I'd be happy to. That's easy. Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. My friends, good to be with you. Good to see all your faces. Hope you're doing well. Thank you. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye. Good Bye.